Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to sort of see you. Um, my name is Emily Levine. I am a member of JCRC of Greater Boston and the chair of the Public Policy Committee here. Um, I would say I am more than thrilled to be here, especially on the heels of such a big day, um, municipally and on the federal level where we learned a lot about what um, showing up and, and feeling like you can find your way into democracy in action, uh, how much that really means. So I'll tell you a little bit about our public policy committee, which um, at JCRC helps to identify issues of importance to the Jewish community. Um, so this is where JCRC's voice can really be leveraged the most to have the most impact. And we work to strategize about how best to engage the community in advocacy around um, issues like defending democracy, race equity and race justice, immigration, um, and many other areas of focus. So our committee drafted and recommended principles on defending democracy that were then adopted by the entire council uh, focused on advancing these priorities. So we have rolled up our sleeves in pursuing action on defending democracy, um, which is inclusive of our advocacy around mail-in voting and ranked choice voting. Last winter, our committee voted to support the Votes Act uh, since it was in keeping with our defending democracy principles. And since then, uh, we joined the coalition advocating for the passage of this bill. So I am pleased to now introduce Jeremy Burton, Executive Director of JCRC, who will help start this really important and again, timely conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, for the introduction and for setting the context. And thank you all of you for being here. Uh, my name is Jeremy Byrne. I'm the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Boston. And before we get to our speaker, uh, I want to provide a little more background on how we got here as the Jewish Community Relations Council and our principles on defending democracy and some of the other work we do in this area. And just to say briefly that uh, over the last several years, in response to growing concerns about the erosion of democratic norms, about trust in government, uh, we and the council of which Emily referred to uh, began to look back at the work we have done historically over decades in support of voter rights and voter access and to recognize that the strengthening of our democratic fabric and the norms was a key priority, uh, not just for the state of the country, but self-interest of the Jewish community in terms of a vibrant liberal democracy being essential to what makes America um, the kind of welcoming society for us and for all communities who have immigrated here and have thrived here. So protecting democracy is a fundamental and enduring value for us at JCRC. In fact, in our mission of many decades, one of our core principles is to promote an American society, which is democratic, pluralistic, and just. And Emily referred to the principles that our council, which is kind of our sort of town meeting of the organized Jewish community, came up with a few years ago. And they include removing barriers to voter registration, ensuring the security and sustainability of our election system, implementing election processes that actualize the will of the voters, 
eliminating discrimination and, and corruption of our democratic system and preserving and restoring democratic norms, all of which have become sadly even more urgent and essential in the years since we embraced them. And so we advocated for safe elections in 2020 during COVID. We supported, as was referenced, election day registration and automatic voter registration that is now part of the Votes Act. And we are part of the Votes Act coalition, which is being led by Common Cause with other key partners. And we're very excited to welcome Jeff Foster to help us understand the components of this bill, how, where the legislation stands now, and to tell us how we can become more involved in supporting this work. I'd like to introduce Jeff. Jeff Foster is the Executive Director at Common Cause Massachusetts, a member-based nonprofit working to hold power accountable and to make democracy more accessible through election and voting reform, campaign finance reform, ethics reform, and government transparency. We'll include his full bio in the chat. And now I will turn it over to Jeff. Jeff, welcome. Hey, Jeremy. And first off, I just wanna give a huge thanks, Jeremy, to you and the whole team uh, for thinking about us uh, and inviting me to join with you all today. I'm really excited for the discussion. What a great time to be talking about this on the heels of what feels like uh, such a historic <laughs> night last night. Uh, so thank you so much and, and hello to everyone uh, who's watching. I have a really brief slideshow that I'm going to share uh, that'll help me just kick off uh, a little bit about um, the work that we've been doing over the last year around democracy here in Massachusetts and, and really focusing on our primary legislation called the Votes Act uh, that Jeremy and I are gonna talk uh, a lot more about. Uh, so allow me real quick uh, to share my screen here. <clears throat> And so uh, again, Jeremy said it perfectly, Common Cause, we are uh, really, it's a national organization. There are over 35 state chapters, uh, Massachusetts being one. Uh, We're actually celebrating our 50th year as Common Cause Massachusetts this year, uh, really working um, in Massachusetts to ensure uh, that there are no barriers or boundaries between an individual and their constitutional right to vote and, and our democracy here. Uh, and so we're going to talk a lot about Massachusetts democracy uh, today in the conversation, but really, as, as Jeremy mentioned, we're really focused on voting rights, uh, campaign finance, ethics, uh, and most recently, we were really involved in some of the redistricting work as well. But really, we want to make sure we have the best government of, by, and for the people as possible, and we know that our constant work uh, is really important to making sure we have the strongest, most equitable, accessible democracy as possible. So we're really excited to be here today. I myself, uh, I am new to my role. I am in month 11 here, coming up on my one year as the new executive director at Common Cause Massachusetts. Wanna give a lot of love and shout out to my predecessor, Pam Wilmot, who many of you may have seen for the last few decades has been leading the work here in Massachusetts. Uh, I actually come to this role with a youth work and youth organizing background, uh, coming out of uh, supporting young people around our gateway cities in Boston to do youth-led policy work at the state level. So really excited to bring the expertise uh, and experience I have uh, listening to, working alongside young people who are truly experts on our democracy, uh, and having a firsthand understanding of how young people, namely young people of color from Boston and our gateway cities, who are excited about voting, uh, experience many barriers to voting. And so I'm bringing that personal experience into this role as we're really fighting for the Votes Act to pass the legislature. Uh, and I just want to bring them to this, this discussion today and center them, uh, as they're a huge reason why I'm here and, and playing the role that I'm playing. So what a year we've had. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, what a year we all had over the last year and a half. Um, and I don't think there's a single person in this country that didn't have some sort of uh, personal relationship with voting, the act of voting, their role in it, even the administration of it. Uh, I mean, there were, as you saw, there were many attempts uh, nationally and on the state level across our country of folks trying to undermine our democracy uh, behind the scenes and the systemic level, but also just interpersonally and on, on social media. It was really, really unfortunate and really harmful to our democracy. And unfortunately, Massachusetts wasn't immune to it. Uh, this didn't make a lot of news, but there was also a small group of folks with Stop the Steal signs uh, that went to our state house uh, on Beacon Hill. They were at the Ashburton entrance and uh, unfortunately, well, thankfully, uh, the, the state police guards at that door uh, were able to lock the door and, and control the situation. But uh, there's, this, there's something I want to make sure everyone's aware of, and, and that is that 
this idea that the you know, threat to our democracy is happening down in DC or, or happening in these other states, uh, and it's not happening in Massachusetts, it's, it's unfortunately not true. And so we have a lot of work to do here in Massachusetts. And so it's in the context of January 6th and the efforts to discredit our democracy that our coalition named the Election Modernization Coalition. And you can see here some of the steering committee groups include Mass Vote, the Mass Voter Table, ACLU Massachusetts, League of Women Voters, Lawyers for Civil Rights, and Mass Perg, uh, that we really, after 10 years of organizing together, said, let's go big. This is the time to, to address Massachusetts democracy in a, in a really important way. Let's go big. Uh, and so we really uh, were looking at what needed to go into legislation with three key lenses. Uh, the first is most important to us is equity and access, knowing that we have a long way to go here in Massachusetts to make sure that all voters uh, have an equitable and accessible means to engage, uh, not just as a voter, but really across the board in civic engagement. The next uh, was really around taking what we were able to pass in legislation last year during the pandemic uh, and the COVID voting expansions. Those were temporary. And, and so we really felt strongly that vote by mail and early voting, not only were they hugely popular, they're just good policy. So part of, part of our focus was wanting to make those permanent. Uh, and then the last bucket for us, it's, it's not as glamorous, but I'm hoping that you're tuning in today because you find this stuff fun too. Uh, but the technical in the weeds things around election infrastructure. And so there are some provisions in the bill as well uh, that address that. So Jeremy and I are gonna dive into this. Uh, I just want you to have this visual to know that the, the Votes Act is comprehensive uh, for equity and access. We're really centering same day registration and jail-based voting. Uh, for the COVID uh, expansions, that's the mail-in voting and early uh, in-person voting, making those permanent. Uh, and election infrastructure really going to highlight what's in the bill around um, updating the automatic voter registration law that was initially passed in 2018, uh, but there needs to be some improvements. And then finally, enrolling Massachusetts into the Election Registration Information Center, also known as ERIC. So happy to go through all of that, what that looks like, what that means. I hope you brought your like really technical questions for me. Um, I'm excited to talk about uh, all of this. Uh, but one thing I want to highlight is this is a hugely popular bill. Uh, not only do we have over 100 plus organizations that endorse this, namely JCRC, one of the very first, and thank you again to the team for your enthusiasm on it, uh, but really across the board, local organizations that do civic engagement and statewide groups that have a, a, a very recognizable name and logo. So this is a very popular bill here, and we really think that this is, this is a really important time in Massachusetts to be having this discussion. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and, and Jeremy, I know we're, we're gonna have a really fun conversation. Who knows where it's gonna go? It's gonna be about the Votes Act, but it might turn into some really fun things on the local level, uh, but I know they'll share again. Here's our website, commoncause.org slash Massachusetts. And if you wanna follow up with me, my email is gfoster at commoncause.org. I'd be more than happy uh, to talk more uh, about the work that we do. Uh, so with that, Jeremy, I know we have some questions and I'm happy to pass it back to you. But again, thank you so much for having me. Great. And thanks for meeting here again. Um, that was very uh, helpful, like top line. Uh, and I definitely appreciate your saying that Massachusetts was not immune because uh, I do think that will lead us into our first, uh, you know, part of this conversation. Uh, for people in the audience, uh, I know after 18 months of this, you're all familiar with how this works, but just a reminder that we have the Q&A function. Uh, so it, we please at the bottom of your screen, feel free to post your questions and I will try to select or consolidate or pull from those and some other questions and we'll have a good conversation. But we'll try to get as many of viewers in as well. And, um, you know, I have to say, I, you know, watching that presentation, which I have not seen that particular slideshow before, just that last slide, with the, the, the array of organizations. And like, I, you know, I will say, I'm proud that we, Jewish Community Relations Council and our community are in this coalition, but there are a lot of, it's a really wide group and a lot of groups that we don't typically have the opportunity to work with and be at one table with. So it's really quite remarkable and a real statement, uh, both about the leadership of the coalition and about what this work means in Massachusetts. But you mentioned Massachusetts not being immune. And so I, I kind of want to start there because like, we have a, let's just say, we have a story we tell ourselves in Massachusetts uh, that we are, you know, the hub of the universe and a shining city on a hill, and you know we love to point, um, or at least, you know, large numbers of people in Massachusetts love to point at the many great progressive um, causes that sort of were born out of Massachusetts, like marriage equality, uh, you know, 
Affordable Care, uh, which was Romney Care before it was Obamacare, et cetera. You know, but it also like, I think people might be surprised to know that Massachusetts is not necessarily at the forefront of, uh, you know, election reform and expanding access to voting. So, you know, I think, you know, as we start to look at this, um, the Votes Act and you did the top line, it would be helpful to maybe begin with where are we behind and where, and I know that several items in the Votes Act are things that like, actually like 10, 20, 30 other states are already doing. So why don't we start there and talk about what's, what's there that's actually already a norm elsewhere in this country? Yeah, so great question. So first off, um, there was a lot going on early this calendar year. You know, I don't know about you, but in my social media news feeds, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, just a ton of outrage over what was happening in Georgia and Florida and Texas and in these states. How dare those legislatures try to capitalize on the political interests of their constituencies to make it harder to vote? Uh, unfortunately, that is not new. Um, that is as traditional as many other things in our country's history. Uh, and in fact, uh, unfortunately, with Massachusetts being one of the very first colonies on this continent, uh, we, are, we are unfortunately not as progressive as I think folks would like. We, we have one of the oldest constitutions uh, in the country, um, much of which is prescriptive in our election laws here. Uh, and was written at a time when only property owning white men were able to vote legally. Uh, and so Massachusetts should always put itself, I think, in context of that national history to understand uh, what's the you know, multi-generational culture that often impacts uh, politics uh, and sometimes political will. Um, and so I, I just want to say that uh, no, uh, one of my lines uh, last last spring when folks were outraged about Georgia and Texas was, you know, I'm with you, but save a little outrage for Massachusetts. Uh, we, we still have far too many barriers that exist structurally, um, buried deep within our, our administrative systems um, that make it harder for certain folks to vote uh, than others. Uh, there was actually a great news piece about a year ago that WBUR did in partnership with others, including Mass Inc., that showed uh, that while early voting as a policy is a really good policy and we fully support it, it's in the Votes Act, that policy alone actually showed an exacerbated gap uh, in, in turnout between white voters in the Democratic primary uh, compared to uh, voters of color. Uh, and so we know that we have to pay careful attention to what policies need to be enacted here in this moment for Massachusetts that really do center equity uh, and really meaningfully uh, chip away at the, the, the gap there in voter turnout. And so the Votes Act does have a lot in it, but I will say, I think the, the marquee item uh, in the Votes Act that Massachusetts is long overdue in enacting is same day registration. Um, we have over 20 other states and Washington DC that already do it. At this point, if Massachusetts were to pass it tomorrow, we would not be an innovator, we would just be catching up. Uh, but we know that same day registration is the great equalizer here. Uh, if any bill that gets to the governor's desk that, that aims to, to really advance voting rights in the Commonwealth really needs to have same day registration in it. Uh, and, and I would just point recently, there, there was a great study done here uh, in Massachusetts at a UMass Amherst that shows that same day registration could potentially increase voter turnout for Black and Latinx voters upwards of 17%. Uh, and so, you know, we, we know too much and we see it working so well in other states. We, we, we need it in Massachusetts. Great. I appreciate that underscoring of what's essential. I mean, uh, and maybe this is like, I, maybe this whole conversation will be wonky. And as you said, hopefully it'll be fun for everybody to get very technical. Uh, but since you underscored uh, same day registration, which as I mentioned in my intro was one of the priorities that JCRC was already supporting before this sort of like, let's do, let's go big and have it all in one bill. So that's certainly for us as well, um, a core principle that we wanna see in any final, um, you know, legislation that gets adopted. I, you know, I'm curious since you opened up the door to sort of like that final legislation is like, so let's get, let's get wonky and talk about what's the status of the bill? You know, where, where is it out? Where, where is it sitting? Um, what is the prognosis right now? Yeah, so um, for folks who have been following along, um, you'll probably know this, but for those who haven't, um, the Votes Act, all things considered, has actually been moving quicker than most bills move, uh, which shows that there is just a lot of excitement. Uh, so the bill was filed in January, and, and by February, the co-sponsor deadline, 
the bill actually had over 83 co-sponsors in the House, which is more than half of the House membership uh, and over half of the Senate as well. Um, and so we knew this was an important time and an important bill. Um, and as you saw in the slideshow, there's, there's a lot of support from different advocacy groups um, at, at all levels. Uh, and so the bill in, in July was moving in a parallel course uh, with the COVID voting expansions, which have been in place. And so what the legislature had to deal with periodically was running into a deadline for those, uh, you know, expanded voting options. And in the midst of municipal elections this year, you know, the legislature really wanted to make sure they, they stayed in place. And so right around the time in July, when the initial uh, uh, deadline was approaching, the legislature acted quickly um, and we saw great support from the speaker who, who the House went to try to make these permanent really quickly through a supplemental budget. Uh, and then the Senate uh, who said, hey, we actually want to go big here. We want to have a full debate on a comprehensive bill. So we're just really, really excited about the support from House and Senate leadership on this. Uh, we were very excited to work with Chair Feingold uh, and Chair Ryan in the Joint Committee on Election Laws. They had, it was one of their first public hearings they had was on the Votes Act, uh, and they worked quickly in July around this time uh, to pass the bill out favorably, where it advanced to the Senate. Uh, and so some folks may have seen this. This was really, really big. Uh, but just a few weeks ago, the Senate brought the bill uh, to the floor for a comprehensive debate. Um, and we were really, really excited that uh, the Votes Act in its entirety, with a few adjustments, uh, passed the, the Senate overwhelmingly uh, and, and has now advanced to the House. So the bill is now in the House uh, Ways and Means Committee with Chair Michael Witz, and we're really excited at this point to engage Chair Michael Witz and the committee uh, and House leadership on, on what they want to do. Great. Um, and that's a very helpful uh, sort of state of where things are right now. Uh, you know, but you mentioned, you know, 87, I think I heard House members support this. You know, we've seen the slide, the overwhelming coalition. And look, our network, we have 40 member organizations. We, you know, work on a wide range of issues across the Hill. And I should mention that some of our other member organizations uh, are also part of this coalition in their own right and are committed to this, including the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action and the Anti-Defamation League. And so like, I know the people who are here with us today are sort of familiar to some degree with the overall sort of like how a bill becomes a law in Massachusetts. And, you know, you look at this and say, oh, you know, all, there are all these co-sponsors, there are all these organizations. So what's the holdup? And, you know, I'm curious if you can, you know, in this sort of space with people who want to be active and, you know, do advocacy and be a part of making this happen, what can we understand about where there is resistance out there across the Commonwealth, what does that resistance look like? What is being said? What is like, what is it we have to overcome as a hurdle right now? Great question. Um, so uh, before I even talk about policy, um, I'll, I'll just, you know, everyone probably knows this, but uh, you know, the legislature to their credit, they, they are required to go through a very deliberative process. Uh, that's good government. Um, you know, I, people often talk to me about their frustration with how slow things might appear to move in the building, but I remind them quickly, just think of all the bad bills that you don't want to pass that this process helps to filter out. Um, and so, you know, there are thousands of bills filed every session. Um, on top of that, there are issues that uh, members care about statewide issues, local issues. So there's just always uh, just a ton of, of different conversations going on about different things. And then obviously, uh, you know, things pop up, issues pop up out of nowhere, maybe national news draws attention to them and it, and it changes the debate. So I will say what is so important at this stage is that we, uh, everyone across Massachusetts that cares to get this bill passed, we have to help uh, facilitate a process by which the members in the legislature and now on the House side, it's the bills now with the House, by which House members feel that this is a rising priority for their constituents. Um, and so as you all probably know, uh, lawmakers are, are really, really interested in getting reelected. And so they're really curious uh, about what do their constituents care about. For any of you who've ever called a state rep on a lobby day or done phone banking, you'll know, you'll probably get asked, are you a constituent? Uh, so I'll just start by saying, you know, we need to make noise. We need to call our state reps. If you do live in a district with a, a House member who's in leadership or a chair of a committee, they are particularly helpful. They would be particularly, uh, uh, you know, impactful. 
um, but the speaker needs to hear from its members. Uh, you know, the speaker cares a lot about what his members uh, want to do, uh, what they want to pass, what legislation they're going to take up this session. Uh, and so if he hears, uh, that's Ron Mariano, Speaker Mariano, if he hears from a lot of his members that, hey, I really care about voting rights. I really think this is the time where the House needs to go big, uh, go bold. Uh, and enact uh, generationally positive reforms to our, our election systems in Massachusetts, then we increase our chances of, of them making it a priority. Um, obviously, the bills with Chairman Mikowitz right now, who, who has uh, really been leading and doing a great job on figuring out uh, how to spend ARPA money from the federal government. And so that's been a huge priority that's been taking up their time. And we know that committee is going to need to spend some, some good time looking through the Votes Act as it came out of the Senate to figure out uh, what makes sense, what they would like to do uh, on the floor. But really, I think our hope um, and our request of the House at this moment is go big. Let's go big here. Uh, we, we are afforded an opportunity with everything going on in our country. Um, it feels like our democracy has survived. Uh, and if you win, uh, if you win, I don't like violence uh, on principle. I don't like war metaphor at all. But if you win a battle, take the time to, to strengthen things up a little bit in house. And, you know, Massachusetts has an opportunity when all these other states are moving in the wrong direction uh, to look inward and figure out where do we still have issues? Where can we make some fixes here? Uh, and we really believe strongly that the Votes Act is, is a powerful outline for, for ways to make our democracy all that much more stronger. Great. So I'm seeing a few questions in the chat already, and we're actually going to get to one of them in a moment um, because I think it connects to some other stuff we want to dive into the bill a little bit, encourage people to put more questions in the Q&A. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit, I think we've, we've, we've uh, covered a bit the sort of the importance of same day registration to a final bill. Uh, you know, you referenced the mail-in and early voting, which I think for most people now, um, because of COVID, if nothing else, you know, is somewhat more familiar to them because we've had this experience now for two cycles. But let's talk about some of the other components of the bill. And I think some people may be familiar with them and some people maybe don't understand them. But like, for example, jail-based voting reforms. And, you know, there's rightly a question that popped up in the chat and I've heard it before, like, but I thought people, once they're convicted, um, you know, aren't able to vote while they're inmates. And that's actually not what this is about. So why don't we clarify what we're talking about when we talk about jail-based voting? Yeah, perfect and, and great question. I see that. Uh, thank you, Dana. So, so real quick, in Massachusetts under law, uh, it was only as recently as 2000 where there was a question on the ballot that uh, I will say, unfortunately, voters passed uh, that would strip convicted felons of the right to vote. So if you're convicted of a felony and incarcerated, you lose the right to vote. However, under the law, the second that you're released, so the second you're no longer uh, under state custody for that conviction, you do regain your right to vote. What's really important to underscore here is that there is a staggering number of folks who are incarcerated in Massachusetts uh, who don't have uh, a felony conviction. Um, almost 50% of the population in our county jails are folks pre-trial, uh, meaning, uh, they're still innocent. Um, and so the fact that 50% of the folks housed in our, our, our jails on the county level uh, are pretrial and innocent raises many concerns. Um, but one of them that is important to us is that they're still eligible voters. Uh, but unfortunately, because of administrative reasons and logistics reasons, and I will say a lack of statute that requires uh, certain, certain administration, um, it's been considered de facto disenfranchisement where if you're incarcerated but maintain the right to vote, it is a lot harder to cast your ballot than if you were at home and able to, to go down to your polling location. And so what we were really interested in with the Votes Act around centering equity and knowing that this is a time to stand up for the needs of our black and brown community uh, members and our neighbors, that in Massachusetts, despite accounting for, for just around 8% of our population, uh, black folks are incarcerated eight times the rate of white people in Massachusetts, which is actually worse than the national average. So we have a problem here in Massachusetts. And if we know that certain communities and neighborhoods are over-policed and therefore there's disproportionate number of black and brown folks represented in our uh, incarceral system, uh, then we know we have an issue there with our democracy. Um, we know that it's disproportionately impact, impacting black and brown communities around voting rights. And so it was really important to us at the bare minimum 
uh, is to really center and lift up the voices of folks who've been incarcerated for a very long time, um, namely the African American Coalition, um, who's helping to lead the Democracy Behind Bars Coalition that we're proud to be a partner of, to say we, we need some reforms here. And so what is in the Votes Act would not change the constitutional uh, uh, issue around convicted felons right to vote. But what it would do is put new statutes in place that would require effective administration of elections for folks who are eligible voters while they're incarcerated. And so that's really important to us because we know there's, there's just about 9,000 folks incarcerated in Massachusetts today who have the legal right to vote. So essentially if I was, you know, I hope I'm not, but like, you know, if I was arrested tomorrow and held without bail for whatever reason, and my trial, you know, was next March, you know, if there's a special election in my town between now and next March, I don't get to vote chance, or it would be extremely hard for me to vote right now, uh, which yeah. is, you know, and, and to Melissa's point, this is a, there's a separate conversation about reinstating the right to vote for convicted felons, which I know is part of other civil rights legislation, but it's not here in this bill. And I don't know if that's something you're also working on. It's where we are 100% in support of, of the full restoration. Um, and, and we believe that, uh, you know, it is, it is not a good look for Massachusetts uh, to, to be doing that. And I will just say part of, the, part of the pain is it's so recent. This happened so recently. This is 2000 that this ballot question passed. This isn't something that's some, you know, 150 year old issue. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but that would require a constitutional amendment. Um, and that is a very long process that requires two consecutive uh, bodies of the general court to vote on. Um, it would require a, a, a ballot question. So we are in support of it, but it is not in the Votes Act for, for the reason of, of how we would make that change under law. Well, let's just take a time out, just explain for maybe some people don't know what is, what is the general court? Excuse me. Oh, the state legislature. So the, right. the sorry, yeah, great question. So, so the, the official, I know it's never used. The official title of the House and Senate as right. a bicameral right. legislative body is, is the Massachusetts General Court. Which only seems to get used in the press when they are meeting on constitutional and ballot issues. Yeah, that's right. And can be a little confusing to us with our Schoolhouse Rock videos. We're like, court, I thought you were talking about the legislative branch. But yeah, we're still in the legislature. Um, so other things that are confusing about the bill, and I, I say this is, you know, you know, when I got my driver's license, uh, there was an automatic voter registration, uh, you know, checkbox uh, when I renewed it last year. Um, I already registered, so it wasn't a, it wasn't an issue, but whatever. Uh, if we have automatic voter registration, why is it in the bill? Awesome question. Um, and this actually isn't too <laughs> difficult to understand uh, when, when we break it down. So there's a gold standard uh, around how states should and could be doing automatic voter registration systems. Uh, namely, you name different uh, you know, government agencies that interact with everyday people. Uh, you name them to be AVR, automatic voter registration agencies. And any time anyone of the general public who's an eligible voter interacts with those agencies, uh, what AVR would do is have an automatic conversation back end that doesn't involve that voter um, to make sure that since they have all the information already on file that could qualify and validate someone's voter registration needs, citizenship, address, age, uh, that that could happen automatically. In 2018, we were very excited because we passed a sweeping election reform bill that included automatic voter registration. The problem was really with implementation. And so what happened with the implementation phase for automatic voter registration is it changed the moment when the voter would be able to opt out. And so it's a back end versus front end issue. And so the way it was implemented is on the front end, when you go to the RMV and you renew your license, there's still a transactional conversation that happens. That's not what we think is the best practice and it's not what we think Massachusetts needs and it's certainly not the gold standard. Uh, so right now, if you go to the counter, instead of before the law where they would say, would you like to register to vote? Now they ask you, would you like to not register to vote? And so we know we're not capturing as many people. When I'm going to the RMV, I'm thinking like, do I need to pay that bill from three years ago? How are my excise taxes? Are they up to date? You're not thinking about this, right? So what backend AVR would do, which is what is in the Votes Act, this is the fix, is there would be no conversation at the counter. 
the clerk at the RMV, because they had that information on the computer would automatically, because of the transaction you had, would automatically update your information and register you. Then you'd get a postcard in the mail that says, because you engaged with this state AVR agency, your information has been updated and you've been registered to vote, mail us back or let us know if you do not want that. And so it's a back end opt out instead of a front end opt out. And we really know that to be the best practice. And it unfortunately wasn't how it was implemented. So the Votes Act uh, looks to clear that up. Really appreciate you uh, clarifying that. And then um, there are other topics I know that are on the common cause uh, sort of agenda. And you know, want to give you a chance to, if there's anything else you want to like bring up while we're here. And I know there's one that you and I particularly interested in maybe talking for a little bit just as we've come out of the election season, but already thinking ahead to next year. But before we get to that, one last question specifically about the bill is really like, uh, risk limited audits and Eric and I will look. I think almost everybody here today now is aware of the concept of audits as a sort of messy, ugly space in the election process. Um, we've certainly watched, say, Arizona this year and said, "Oh, there better be good rules in place for how we do audits." But can you say just a little bit about audits and what on earth is Eric? Great question. So the 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 quick on, on risk limiting audits. Um, so they did not make it through the Senate. Risk limiting audits were not in the final bill that was passed by the Senate. Um, and that's okay. Uh, we know it's a very technical and in the weeds issue. Um, and hey, it gives us another bill to file next session. Um, but yes, so audits as a term are very confusing right now. Um, unfortunately, what is a very important part of our election infrastructure and a very important part to validate and, and make the public have high confidence in the results of our elections, audits are a good thing. Um, you know, if, if you uh, have a car and you never take it to the mechanic, uh, you're probably not going to have that car nearly as long as you would if you had it checked every now and again. And so audits serve as a check uh, on, on how our democracy is running. So some states don't even have audits. Uh, Massachusetts does have an audit system. It works really well. Uh, the secretary's office uh, works very closely with local clerks to administer it. Risk limiting audits is simply a statistical threshold that we would put in that would guarantee a certain threshold of risk uh, in terms of the results from the machines and how they're being tabulated by people. And so uh, it, it just sets a bar that would require a continued analysis if, if that threshold wasn't met, uh, if there wasn't at least a 95% confidence that the results were accurate, meaning there's less than 5% risk that they're not accurate. Uh, and so we really do believe in that policy, but we also know the issue of audits has become really, um, really ugly in other states, Arizona being a prime example. And so I think it was, unfortunately for Massachusetts, uh, it was a turnoff to even discuss, should we be doing more audits here in Massachusetts? Again, it's okay. Um, we do think it is the best practice. We do support it. Um, and But we think the conversation is probably uh, another day. Every four years, Massachusetts does an audit. And part of what was in the Votes Act would be to increase that frequency to every two years. Um, so it's not in the House bill, which is okay. ERIC is uh, a sh short for the Electronic Registration Information Center. This is actually a great interstate uh, program. It's a nonprofit organization, actually, that was, that was uh, supported through Pew Charitable Trusts. And what it does is it brings experts into the states to work closely with their secretaries and their clerks to make sure that they're providing the best possible information from other states or, or at the national level that we have access to, to guarantee our voter rolls are as accurate as possible. So if someone moves from one state that enrolls in ERIC to another, say, you know, from Pennsylvania to Maryland, they'll have that interstate communication and say, hey, it looks like Jeff Foster. He spells his name with a G. This might be that same Jeff Foster who was born January 13th that was in your state that's now in my state. Then they validate it. And then Maryland knows to take Jeff Foster off their rolls. So it is a great program. Uh, it's very cost effective. Uh, for states that they can choose to enroll themselves into that would allow us to have uh, much more accurate voter rolls. And so we did pass that in 2018, unfortunately, without a deadline. Uh, and so we haven't, our secretary has not yet enrolled us into ERIC. And so what we have put in the Votes Act is a deadline for when Massachusetts would need to enroll. Thank you for uh, clarifying that and noting that this is actually stuff we've already done 
and adopted and just there's an implementation issue here that needs a little yep. bit of a push. Um, so switching gears, you know, I know you are really passionate about democracy and all aspects of democracy as are, as are we. Um, and um, I, I'll be candid, some of our team was like, oh, this is going to get so boring right now. But I think, uh, I think this is something that's interesting to you and to me is redistricting. And I know that uh, you have been very involved in redistricting process. We are part of the Drawing Democracy Coalition, which certainly had some fairly significant wins um, in the House and Senate uh, districts and you know what's been achieved in Brockton in terms of uh, representation, what's been achieved in the House in terms of increasing the number of majority minority districts. But uh, you know, I'd love, you know, can you speak more to the issue of redistricting, why that's important, not, you know, here in Massachusetts and um, you know, we're sort of near the end of that process, but maybe a little about your work and sort of what's ahead. Yeah, so redistricting is one of those things that you just say the word and people tend to get a little glossy eyed. They're like, what is that? Look, I cannot emphasize how important redistricting is. Um, it is the canvas. This every 10 year process, we create our maps. It is the canvas upon which our democracy is drawn. Um, and so it is so important for, for folks like ours, JCRC, Common Cause. Uh, and I really want to give a shout out to Beth Wong at the Mass Voter Table, who has been our fearless uh, leader here in the Drawing Democracy Coalition. Um, we are really focused this uh, once every 10 years to make sure that anywhere in Massachusetts, there's an opportunity to further empower and elevate and center the political power of Black and Brown community members. We were going to do it. Um, and so we are really, really excited uh, that the House, House particularly went above and beyond even what we were asking. So uh, Chairman Moran, uh, huge thank you again. Um, and the Senate was really also willing to work with us uh, on, on most of what we were asking for. Um, there was a big change in the Merrimack Valley uh, where Lawrence now has a Latino majority Senate district. There's obviously a, a big change down in Brockton and a change in Boston. Um, and so we're really excited because we really think that this is an in the weeds way to, to better diversify uh, our elected, uh, uh, namely the state legislature, but also there's congressional opportunities, right? 10 years ago, there was a new congressional district drawn and, and you know, was, what, eight years later, uh, we saw Congresswoman Ayanna Presley come out and win that seat. And so we know that we have work to do to make sure that we, Massachusetts, we, see ourselves and our diversity represented in the diversity of our elected officials. And so it's really in the redistricting process that you can do a lot of this work effectively. And, and we're really proud. We, we were able to get a lot of wins uh, over the last few weeks. I will say uh, that the legislature just put out this week their proposed congressional maps. Uh, and so they're having a public hearing this coming Monday. So if anybody here is listening uh, and wants to look at what they're recommending for the new congressional maps in Massachusetts, uh, check it out. If you have strong opinions, make yourself heard. Uh, I will say on behalf of the Drawing Democracy Coalition uh, that we really think it's important uh, for the voices uh, of marginalized communities um, down in New Bedford and Fall River. We think that those two municipalities need to be uh, brought together completely and in the same congressional district. Uh, and we know uh, that there, there are a lot of folks who, who are pushing for that as well. Uh, and so there is still work to be done, but this is redistricting is so important. Uh, if anybody here has an organizing egg timer that you like to set, set it for like eight and a half years, because in eight and a half years, we're going to want to start paying attention again uh, to the potentials for, for more progress to be made next decade. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, the eight and a half year mark. Uh, I actually started here 10 years ago last month. And so I, I remember coming in here and being like, I just missed the window uh, on the cycle. It was like wrapping up. And this time around, much more engaged on a personal level uh, than we were. You know, I do want to, like, I want to sort of unpack that a little more because this issue with the two gateway cities uh, down in the southern tier, uh, you know, right now, if I remember correctly, uh, you know, they are split. Um, and in fact, they're not just split in two different districts in the current congressional districts, but one of them is actually split as a city between two different districts. And I know that's been, you know, there are many issues that come up in redistricting, one of which is obviously increasing the opportunities for representation, majority, minority, or other kinds of representation districts. One of them is also about uh, keeping districts or keeping towns whole. And I know that has been a, you know, that was an issue in sort of negotiating 
Brockton, there was an issue in sort of the Merrimack Valley. Um, so knowing that the current maps that the legislature has put out, make sure that each of these two communities is whole as itself. Uh, can you speak, and knowing frankly that there are two members of Congress, one of uh, who represent this area, who have already offered different public opinions about the lines. I'm curious if you can speak to why is it important that the two, which have been separate and in which were broken up probably even more so in the prior districts, why is it important to consolidate them in one district? And if I can be completely nerdy about it, wouldn't it be in terms of, since they cannot be connected to enough communities to create another majority minority district. There's just like no, nobody's proposing that there's a second majority minority district to be made uh, around them. Could it be argued that it is better for them to have two members of Congress committed to the gateway priorities of the Southern tier by each having one of those cities? Good question. So I'll, I'll start by saying what is so important for any redistricting process is to really understand the term communities of interest, right? And so communities of interest is, is a very loose definition, but one in which we put people together and we figure out where our communities could literally be on a neighborhood, right? So I live in Lowell and people might ask like, what, where do you live in Lowell? And I would say, I live in Centerville. I live in the Centerville neighborhood in Lowell. Uh, and so uh, what's really important is, and, and this is something that the Drawing Democracy Coalition did a great job of, is soliciting wide public input from everywhere across Massachusetts to figure out where are all the communities of interest that we care about. That could be uh, people who share uh, in a, you know, a regional economy. That could be people who share access to a body of water. It could be folks who speak the same language that may not be English. It could be folks who practice the same religion all of these different things we want to factor in. And what is also uh, a key principle of redistricting uh, is to make sure that communities of interest are kept whole. And so what, what you're, you're asking a great question uh, around, well, doesn't it give like, you know, these two cities, namely Fall, Fall River and New Bedford, doesn't it give them each a member of Congress? In a sense, yes, but we really think that there's a community of interest in those two cities that needs to be centered here. Uh, and we do think that together, um, if they were united in one district, they would have a lot more of a successful influence and impact over their elected official. And so there's the, on the flip side, there is the sense that divided, they, they're at 50% capacity to influence on the issues that they care about, especially since our congressional districts are very big in Massachusetts, right? And, and so in a region like mine up here in Lowell, you know, you have one congressional district that goes to some very rural, uh, very, in some sense, conservative communities and then ties into Lowell and Lawrence and Haverhill. And so you have to weigh all the different needs of the constituencies. And what's important to us is that there's no group or no community of interest that feels like they don't have uh, as much influence as they should to their elected officials. And so what we believe really down uh, with what's going on right now is uh, a need to pay attention to communities of interest in Fall River and New Bedford, um, who have been speaking up. There's been great leadership from, from folks in the community level for many months. Um, part of our coalition that have spoken loud and clear and said our, our priority is to keep these two communities together in one congressional district. And so I think what's really important for us is, is to really honor their position. Um, special shout out to the Coalition for Social Justice, folks who have been doing great work for many, many years down there on, on, on this very issue. And so uh, that, that's how we got to our opinion as a coalition. And, and I do think also on principle, um, you know, those two cities, uh, they have a lot of shared history, they have a lot of shared culture, they have a lot of shared economic and regional interests. And so it, it might be best for their impact on the federal stage through their member of Congress to be united. I appreciate you uh, drilling down because I think the, the, the terminology of communities of interest, which goes beyond sort of like federal voting rights or the explicit sort of majority minority um, top of line priorities is an important one to emphasize and to understand so that people understand why is drawing democracy and why is the coalition looking at that particular thing in, in this cycle, especially for some of us who like, I, look, I live in Cambridge. Um, literally, if I reached across out my window to the building across the street, I'd be in another congressional district. I'm not exaggerating. You know, we are definitely one of those cities that is split in a very strange way between two districts and there are reasons for it. Um, so community of interest is an important thing to lift up since we don't see that and always understand that in every part of every one of these districts. We are running out of time 
Um, and I'll be curious to come back to that one with you in two weeks to see where we are on the final lines and what happens and frankly, what other, to accommodate that, what other changes would have to be made with other communities of interest. But what I would just want to like wrap up, and first of all, you've been incredibly kind uh, to tell your ho the host that every single question is a good question. So I thank you for that. But also to ask you one last question, and I hope it's a good question, which is, so what can we do to support your work and the work on the Votes Act right now? Uh, thanks again. And, and again, Jeremy and the whole team, thanks so much for putting these on. Uh, this is great civic engagement. This alone is a great example of what we should be doing more of. Um, and also to everyone participating right now or watching, thank you. I'm, I'm sure that you're tuning in because you do care uh, and you do want to help. Um, and so I'll say this, you know, we have work to do in Massachusetts. Um, we have work to do, not just at the institutional level, but as individuals. Uh, and I think we all had our own experiences last year where we really knew uh, we had to lean into the work. Um, and not just around racial equity, but also around democracy. Um, and, you know, I yesterday participated in my local election up here in Lowell, and we, we barely, we did, actually didn't, we did not exceed 20% voter turnout. Uh, I mean, that is a tragedy. That is, that, is a, that is indicative of an unhealthy democracy, right? And so we know we have a lot of work to do. The Votes Act is a very important uh, piece of legislation to get involved with because we know it could have statewide impact. Um, and so we're really excited about all the different provisions of the bill. Uh, we really do think though right now equity needs to be front and center and so any bill that does get to the governor really needs to take into account that there's a gap between voters of color and white voters in massachusetts that we need to address and so that's why same-day registration is so important and jail-based voting is so important to us as well really specifically the ways that right now in this moment you could help is help us get the buzz going um, we know that the House supports these things. The House has already, has already passed vote by mail and early voting this session. Uh, they have in previous sessions already passed AVR and passed enrolling us into ERIC. Uh, and so, you know, we have a lot of work to do now to engage the House. So the more your state reps hear from you about why the Votes Act is so important and why you think the House needs to take up this bill in its entirety, uh, the more they hear from you, the more that that will help uh, encourage and, and, and facilitate, you know, leadership, uh, paying attention to the bill, putting their staff time and energy into what needs to happen, and ultimately bringing it to the floor for a vote. And so, you know, it's good for a lot of us organizations with recognizable names, and it's good for us who are vocal on Twitter. I mean, that is good. Uh, but what's really important here is that we're also facilitating good democracy. We need people to get involved. Uh, I am a lobbyist. I am an advocate. Um, lawmakers hear from me all the time, but they need to hear from you. Your state rep needs to hear from you. And the more they do, the more uh, likelihood we're going to be able to see a vote uh, on the Votes Act on the House floor soon. And so, um, again, I know folks will share it, um, but if you just want to go to commoncause.org slash Massachusetts, there's a button right there to sign up uh, to get emails on the Votes Act. We would welcome all of you. Uh, also, to, I'm, I'm sure JCRC, I know, has been on the front lines helping us do advocacy. They will keep you posted uh, as well. But I couldn't be more thrilled to have you all as partners. Uh, and I'm so excited that all of you turned out today to, to start a conversation about a stronger democracy. Well, I don't know what this thing called Twitter is that you referenced, but I do want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, Jeff, you've been great, and it's been really helpful to learn more. I've certainly learned some things about both the bill and quite the particulars of the Votes Act and in general about you and about the work you're doing. Uh, you can learn more about Common Cause on their website, which we've included already, the link in the chat. You can also learn more about JCRC's work on defending democracy and all of our legislative priorities. We'll include that link in the chat as well. We at the Jewish Community Relations Council have several speaker series programs coming up in the next few weeks. You can check them out on our website and register there. We'll include that link. Our next program will be this coming Wednesday, one week from right now at 12 noon, when we're gonna have a conversation with Congressman Jake Achenkloss to discuss his priorities for Massachusetts and what he has seen and experienced as working on as a freshman in the house. Again, you can register by going to the link in the chat and I hope you can join us for this and many of our upcoming programs. And I hope you'll, we'll see you uh, at the State House virtually and hopefully soon in person to work on the Votes Act and all of our agenda together. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>